amount of imperial splendor could redeem. The United States faces a similar prospect, remaining as wealthy and powerful as ever, but leaving its heritage behind. Mm -hmm. Charles, explain. We've been talking throughout these uh, conversations we've had, Peter, about America's civic culture. Well, when you think about American exceptionalism, what what are people really talking about? Why is it that people all over the world looked at the United States and said we were different? Well, some aspects were the land of opportunity. You could go to the United States, you could make something of yourself, uh, and uh, your children could live a better life than, than you did. But another aspect of this exceptionalism was people would look at us and see the way that Americans solved problems and helped each other at the local level, and it was very close to unique. Um, you know, th th there are all sorts of cultures that have very strong traditions of hospitality to strangers uh, or hospitality to guests, period. You try to find cultures in which people who just happen to live near each other voluntarily help each other, that is really rare. Um, in fact, it's so rare that I, I, I think the word unique is really close to applicable. We had that. Uh, we had it early. It, it was. We had Tocqueville, Tocqueville, Tocqueville early you know, his, the, the famous quote about Americans forming associations at the drop of a hat. Tocqueville's democracy essentially describes America's civic culture, and it conforms to the kinds of, of characteristics that I've been describing. But that persisted. The Marvin Olasky, in his book, The Tragedy of American Compassion, uh, published many years ago, has this wonderful compilation of organizations in New York City uh, from the churches, from the Protestant churches. And it's talking about dozens of centers for educating disadvantaged children. Of uh, You can go through, it's, it's just an incredible inventory of things that were done, and that's just the Protestants. Leaves out the Catholic diocese and all of the stuff it was doing, the Jewish uh, activities, leaves out all the secular. It's, it's, this, it's this cornucopia of stuff that was going on. And one reason you feel this so deeply is that you experienced it. Yeah, I lived in small town. Small no, it town small, Iowa. It was small town Iowa. Fifteen thousand people. All right, and and I experienced exactly that kind of of civic culture that has ex existed there. But I want to emphasize, Peter, it also existed in neighborhoods in large cities. Uh, so it's not urbanization that prevents this from happening. It is it is other kinds of causes, but whatever those causes may be, that civic culture is unraveling mostly in one segment of American society. So it's been, this has been a long rambling uh, response no, no, to your no, question. No, I but find it all alarming and moving. But, but, it's why, but it's why we're losing something that is irreplaceable. And you identify the difficulties in Fishtown, folks who are not getting married, who aren't doing well, who, many of whom are out of the workforce. And then you say, is there hope that the new upper class, these people of unprecedented wealth and privilege and education and brains will do the decent thing and try to redress this. And you know what? You're not at all sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. In Coming Apart, quote, my proposition is that the hollow elite, imagine working through four years at a fancy school and then getting called hollow by Charles Murray. <laughs> My proposition is that the hollow elite is as dysfunctional in its way as the new lower class is in its way. Personally, and as families, its members are successful, but they have abdicated their responsibility to set and promulgate standards." Close quote. Well, explain yourself. We are now in the age of non-judgmentalism. Uh, you go to any college campus and you try to engage the students there in a discussion of right and wrong. And Excuse me, Dr. Murray, you mean appropriate and inappropriate. <laughs> appropriate. Or, you know, relative to the situation that right. we... And, and who are we to prescribe to others? Well, the, here's the problem. Every vital civilization, uh, and I'm drawing actually on the work of Arnold Toynbee here, who wasn't right about everything, but I think he was right about some very important things. Civilization... Toynbee is a famous historian who compares more than 20 civilizations across the long yeah. sweep of history. The book, the works... It's a ten, volumes, ten volumes, ten volumes for, for the whole thing. Early 20th century? I'm trying no, to no, just mid 20th century. Mid 20th, all yeah, right. And it's an incredible work of erudition. But anyway, uh, he says, look, the, 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 the sign of a growing culture, a vital culture, is a dominant uh, creative minority, as he calls it, who, uh, set the, who set the tone 
and the rest of the society follows along. And they, this, this uh, creative minority is confident, it's energetic, uh, and then when you have a declining civilization, the creative minority becomes a dominant minority, still runs the country, but it no longer has the confidence in its own rightness and uh, of, of what it's doing. And, and that's, that's what I think I see happening in the United States. Okay, so fumbling around to understand the argument, I a couple of examples come to mind. One in its way commendable, the other not commendable ever. And the one that was for a time in its way commendable is the British, 19th century British. Mm -hmm. Think, make what you will of Absolutely. colonialism, there's verve and self-confidence, and then by about the 30s, they've lost their own self-confidence. Yeah. Is that right? Uh, yeah. That's what you mean. It's, it's one of the most dramatic examples, and, and Gertrude Himmelfarb's book, The Idea of Poverty, is a wonderful uh, source for this. <laughs> the, the British upper class, no, not the aristocracy, the, the upper middle class. Uh, it's the colonels, not the generals, the, the but the colonels. The, the Victorians. Right, right, right. They propagandize the whole country into buying into their system of morals, and, and as a result, you had this incredibly rapidly urbanizing society which actually experienced falling crime during the same period of its most dislocating urbanization. Um, it, when you presented a letter of recommendation when you were seeking a new job, it was called your character. Queen Victoria, we have in her diaries, one of the first diary entries after she becomes queen at the age of 18, she writes, I will be good. I will be good. Peter, I'm so glad to use that word because it brings out another point I want to emphasize with the, the hollow elite. What do we teach our children now? We teach them to be nice. We teach them to share their toys, not to hit each other and so forth. The idea that being good is a thing that you aim toward with all of the self-discipline, the thinking ahead to long-term consequences, and the rest that being good requires. The remorse, which you rightly experience when you've done something bad. Uh, the, so th something bad. Um, all of these things are, are not part of the raising of our children. We want them to be nice. Being nice is a way of moment to moment not creating trouble. It is not a way of inculcating standards of behavior that will get you through tough times. And uh, that's a major part of the hollowness of the elite. Coming apart, quote, here's the way to solve the problem. Quote, over the course of the 20th century, Western Europe developed an alternative to the American model, the advanced welfare state that provides a great deal of personal freedom in all areas of life except the economic ones. You write that more and more Americans, including, quote, prominent academics and the leaders of the Democratic Party, close quote, believe we should embrace the European model, improving life in Fishtown by expanding the welfare state. Well, why not? The new upper class has gotten so rich, tax them a little more, take, just take care of people in Fishtown. Right. What, what harm can that do? Yes. Well, what harm can it do? It goes to the pursuit of happiness. And uh, if you take happiness seriously as a concept, and I use Aristotle as my guide for that, you're talking about lasting and justified satisfaction with life as a whole. And you ask yourself, now what is it that gives people lasting and justified satisfaction with life in a whole? And it has been my argument that I've been writing about for many years that basically you've just got four domains within which that happens, and those are family, faith, uh, community, and vocation. Now, you don't have to... Vocation meaning something a little larger than job. Yeah, it's, it's, well, in most cases, it's the work you do for a living, but I, can, I will also include avocations with that, or causes. Um, but I'm saying that's basically all there are. And that in order for a person to pursue happiness, those institutions of meaning, if you want to use that phrase, have to be rich and vital. Well, how is it that a family is rich, the family structure is rich and vital. It's because the family has things that won't get done unless the family does them. There has to be responsibility placed on the institution called the family to make it rich and vital. Same thing goes with community. Same thing goes with, with all of them. And what the welfare state does, in my view, and I reserve all of this for Chapter 17, so that my friends... You don't pick a fight until the last moment. I, 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 my friends on the left can read the whole book and I tell them you are absolutely free to read everything so far and say what he's really done is make a case for 
a redistribution of state. Okay, that's fine with me. But in Chapter 17, I say the problem with the welfare state is it drains the life from life. It, by trying to smooth over the bumps, trying to give it lend a helping hand, it ineluctably, inevitably takes away the stuff of life from these institutions. And those are as essential for a person in Fishtown as they are for a person in Belmont. So what do we do? Uh, what's, you, the, what's the you, you would ask that, wouldn't you? Uh, everybody wants to know the solution. Well, I will tell you what the solution is not. It is not a, a, a system of domestic service where we draft all young people and send them out to mix with each other. That won't work. Uh, it's not a renewal of the draft. It's not government regulations. Uh, You're not uh, going to force these two cultures to mix. It, yeah, it, 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 it's not a matter of just me being a libertarian and, and horrified by that prospect. It's a matter of me who made his living as a program evaluation uh, evaluator saying, ain't going to work. Uh, here's what happens, has to happen before we even have a chance at a solution. We have to have a cultural shift in our attitude toward what's going on. That means, for example, for the people encapsulated in their enclaves, there are super rich, super well-educated enclaves with their own culture. The super zips. People the super zips. The super zip They've got to figure out, do you really want your children to grow up as hothouse flowers? Do you really want your children to be unaware of this rich panoply of life that is out there in America that right now they have not an inkling about? And if you don't want that, there are things you can do. Uh, and and they're, they're, I won't try to go into the specifics. I did it by moving to a town of 270 people. That worked pretty well. No, I'm sorry, 170 people. That worked pretty well, but you don't have to be that extreme. Um, th th we have to have, for something like births to unmarried women, sort of as a natural statement that journalists make when they write articles about problems of disadvantaged neighbors or whatever, that in fact being born to unmarried women causes all sorts of problems for the children in their future life, independently of poverty, and independently of parent, parental education. That, ought to, that has to be in the air. Not, you don't have to demonize women who have babies out but of wedlock. Just telling the truth. You've you just got to tell the truth about the costs associated with that. Uh, so there has to be a cultural shift. The cultural shift will not occur until we are all contemplating the nature of the problem, and that is what I've tried to do in the book. We support Obamacare? That helps. No, you know. You don't want to be dragged. You know, into the I, current, that expression on my face. You don't want to face. be dragged into the current mud fight. Yeah, no, you? but the, the, you know, Obamacare is ancillary to the kinds of things I'm talking about, as I think a lot of. It public, is a symptom. Yeah, it's it's a symptom of the increasing welfare state. But whether Obamacare is repealed or not repealed is going to be twiddle at the margins with the kinds of dynamics I'm talking about. Um, no, the, there is almost no direct, immediate, concrete policy implication of the book. There are huge implications for how we need to think about the nature of the problem. And I think of the book as starting a conversation. Or I, I'd like to think that it starts hundreds of thousands or millions of conversations, <laughs> even though that's a little overambitious. Charles Murray, author of Coming Apart, would you close our conversation today by simply reading a passage from your book. I would like that. Thank you, Peter. A man who is holding down a menial job and thereby supporting a wife and children is doing something authentically important with his life. He should take deep satisfaction from that and be praised by his community for doing so. If that same man lives under a system that says the children of the woman he sleeps with will be taken care of whether or not he contributes, then that status goes away. Taking the trouble out of life strips people of major ways in which human beings look back on their lives and say, I made a difference. Raising a family, supporting yourself, being a good friend and a good neighbor, learning what you can do well and then doing it as well as you possibly can, providing the best possible framework for doing those things is what the American Project is all about. When I say that the American Project is in danger, that's the nature of the loss I have in mind the loss of the framework through which people can best pursue happiness. Charles Murray, author of Coming Apart, thank you. It's been my pleasure. For Uncommon Knowledge, I'm Peter Robinson.